All right, everybody, we are live. It is 2 o'clock, Sunday the 19th. Thank you for joining me on this lovely day, much nicer than yesterday for those of you who were around Carver County. Um, so again, if you, you know, as always, if you are watching, you need to put a emoji or a hello in the comments so I know that you're watching. Otherwise, I can't see who's watching. So if you are here joining us, go ahead and say hi um, so I can acknowledge you. Thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. So today is going to be a little different than the last few that we've done since we don't have a prescribed agenda or a prescribed um, topic and we did not have very many questions submitted this week. So um, just a quick reminder too, if you would like to submit a question for next week, the week after, whatever, you can do that on the website. Um, you can also email me, text me, call me, anything like that, and I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, again, we will, you know, answer questions. I will answer questions that are in the comments too. So if you got questions, bring them on. Um, I see Nancy's watching. Hey, Nancy. Hey, Eric. Thanks for your help this week, you guys. Really great. So we'll start out with kind of the negative topic of coronavirus as we're still fighting it and it's still very much a thing uh, regardless of what you might see in the papers. So um, as of this morning, Carver County was at 543 confirmed cases. That's a heck of a lot more than the last time. Um, we're up to two deaths now, unfortunately, and 32 hospitalizations. So it is still very much um, on the uptick and I do want to address the, the most pressing thing I think is that um, or misinformation that's being spread that it is just affecting people that are living in senior living homes, um, assisted living homes, nursing homes, that kind of thing, or it's just affecting people that are over the age of 80. For our county, Carver County, uh, only 30 cases of those 543 are over 65 years old. The majority of these new cases that we're seeing are people my age, people between 18 and 34. Um, and I'm 32, so very much right, you know, in that prime spot of getting it. Um, you know, there's a higher chance, of course, of someone who is younger and healthier recovering a little easier from it, but that's not a guarantee. And we don't know, um, we don't know a lot. There's still a lot we don't know about this virus. So it is still very, very critical that we don't get bored with quarantine. We don't get, um, you know, very selfish in the masks. Uh, wearing, you know, you should be wearing a mask. You should be social distancing. Um, oh, Gary's here too. Hey, Gary. I think both of you had recent birthdays too. So happy birthday to both of you if I missed it. Um, so there was an article. I actually will post it in the comments really quick for you guys. Um, Carver County, I've been so impressed with the local government here um, and their response to the coronavirus. Um, so I just posted that in the chat. They, Corona, uh, I'm sorry, First Street, First Street Center, uh, put on by our sponsor, well, is part of the Carver County local government here in Chaska, is sponsoring a virtual um, kind of therapy session on Thursday nights, and it's all about coping with um, the new normal that we're living in right now. And you guys know, I've, I've spoken about this many a time, that mental health is right up at the top of my list and issues that need to be addressed at the state legislature. Um, really something that's vitally, vitally important, even more so now than it was before. It's really difficult and weird and not, you know, human nature to be secluded in your homes by yourself, with your family, whatever it might be. Um, you know, there's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of scary um, things that we're unsure about. And part of dealing with that can be therapy and therapy can be expensive. So this virtual group um, is a way to kind of explore the avenue of therapy if that works for you. And it's, you know, folks that live around here. It's people just like me and you that are joining this group and talking about, you know, what they're doing to cope. So um, highly recommend checking that out. Hi, Mrs. Gale, my former teacher um, is watching as well. So check that out if you, um, you know, feel like that might help. I, I highly encourage it. I've spoken very openly about the fact that I have a therapist. I go to therapy every week and I would not trade any, I mean, it's it's invaluable. Um, investing in something like that for yourself is a huge, really necessary investment. And thank you, Carver County Local Government for putting that on for our, um, our community here. Really appreciate that. That's such a great thing. 
Um, so let's talk about masking for a minute. And I know I'm preaching in the choir and I'm, you know, going on and on and on about it, but I cannot stress enough. Masking is not that big of a deal. It's really, really not. So I've seen, especially at the state legislature in the past, you know, few weeks um, and in the media, there's been a lot of back and forth with are masks effective? Are they harmful? Are they, um, you know, going to do anything? Oh, it's just making you feel better. And I'm going to quote Dr. Fauci here. I don't know how to explain to you that you should care about other people. <laughs> and that is not, that is so true. I mean, if masks are effective, which most of the data says that, it, that they are, um, and I believe that they are, that's such a great thing to signal to others that you care about them, that you care about their well-being. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, my friends that have gone back to work at the bars and restaurants. Um, you know, my coworkers, former coworkers are back to work now, and I don't feel safe enough to go back uh, and start bartending now for myself, but those that are, are saying, you know, there's a lot of people coming in without masks and businesses are struggling to protect their workers. So even if it's, you know, if it's, it's not about you, basically is what I'm trying to say, you're wearing a mask to protect other people. It's not going to protect you from the coronavirus. We know that you could still get coronavirus if you're wearing a mask. Yes, that's a possibility. Um, it is, there's a huge chance that if you have it and you're asymptomatic, you won't give it to other people if you're wearing a mask. I struggle, um, you know, me personally, with my mom as high risk as she is, I really, really struggle to understand people who are saying um, that wearing a mask infringes upon their rights and that um, people that are high risk should just stay home. Well, what about my mom's rights? You know, if we're all not masking and there is no vaccine yet, and you know, wh what about her life? Does that not matter? Does she not get to have her life back? Because we can't guarantee that people will be wearing masks when we go out. So it's always uh, on the forefront of my mind that it's just such an easy thing to signal to others that you care about them, that you care about living in your community and you're doing the best thing that you can. Even if it's, you know, worst case scenario, it's not effective. You wore a piece of cloth on your face for a little bit. Big deal. I, you know, people in the army, people in the military wear gas masks. I mean, one time I hiked up a volcano, the side of a volcano, long story, in Bali, wearing a gas mask. The most terrifying thing I've ever done in my life, but I did it. And that was a lot more constricting and harmful than a piece of cloth over my face. So um, I understand the resistance to kind of doing whatever the government says. I get that. I mean, I don't feel that way, but I get how people could. Um, this is not that. This is part of living in a community that shows that you care about others. So please, 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 if you care about your community, your fellow community members, if you care about those people, those cashiers, those um, baristas, those bartenders, your waiter, um, or waitress, even whatever, just show them that you care by wearing a mask. Uh, there was a, a quote from the director of the CDC, I believe, that said, if we all mask up and we all wore masks in public, we could squash this in six to eight weeks. Wouldn't that be great? We could open up businesses. We could like really get back to, well, kind of semi-normal um, or post-COVID normal if we all just pitched in and helped out. So please, please, please wear a mask. Um, there have been a couple questions about Governor Walls issuing a mandate. Oh, Brian, I'm on team, hashtag team wear a mask. Absolutely, me too. I don't know if that is a hashtag, but we should make it one. <laughs> Absolutely, mask up. Um, and there's really cute ones that you can wear too. So it's it's a good look. And you don't even, you have, you, for women, or whoever wears lipstick, you don't have to put on lipstick. If you're wearing makeup, I mean, there's so many benefits to it, right? Uh, so back to what I was saying, there has been a couple questions about Governor Walls issuing a mask mandate. Uh, I don't think that that's going to happen. I think for a lot of our small business owners, the ones that I've spoken with at least um, in our community have expressed some really being in tough spots. You know, they're trying to protect their employees and they're trying to protect themselves and make sure that their business can stay open. Um, people that come in and are being asked to wear a mask are reacting with hostility and they're taking it out on the person telling them that, whether that's, a, you know, hourly employee barista or the business owner. Uh, having our state legislature or our governor issue a mandate to wear a mask in public spaces would take that pressure off of our small business community um, to make those hard decisions and enforce that on their own. So I 
of course would prefer if the governor would do that um, on his own and not leave that to individual business owners, but it doesn't look like that's gonna happen. So um, I think the last I heard was he was waiting for some buy-in with um, some of the Republicans in the state legislature in order to issue that mandate. And that uh, we know we've seen a lot of uh, stalemates happening. We know that's not gonna happen. So um, we've seen a lot of even big businesses, I think Target, Caribou, CVS, Walgreens have um, issued those mandates or those orders themselves to wear a mask in their business. So keep in mind, um, for those of you who are not on hashtag team wear a mask, that the person who's telling you that you have to wear a mask is likely 99% of the time not the person that made that decision. They're, you know, just repeating things that come from higher up. So taking it out on that person, um, you know, of course you do have a right to wear, to not wear a mask, but that business has a right to ask you to wear one. And if you choose not to wear one, you can be asked to leave. And that is within the business's right to do that. So don't take it out on the cashier, the bartender, you know, it's just, just be kind, please. That's my plea. Um, and I do want to repeat, uh, MDH, the Minnesota Department of Health and the CDC have said that masks are not a replacement for physical distancing. So if you are out at a happy hour, outdoor happy hour, or visiting one of the local businesses, uh, restaurants here, um, oh, Lunds and Byerly's are also going to require masks. Great. That, that just makes me feel so much better that, you know, my mom can maybe go out in public and, and people can grocery shop. I mean, my mom said the other day she never, she hates grocery shopping but she never thought she would miss it until now. And, you know, so I guess we'll be going to Lunds and Byerly's then <laughs> instead. Um, so, you know, MDH and the CDC have said that masks are not a replacement for physical distancing. So please, even if you're wearing a mask outside, which I highly recommend, uh, stay six feet apart from each other. You know, these, I'm seeing a lot of parties and um, people gathering and taking pictures and it's really disheartening. It's still, going to continue the spread. So let's just all do our part. We all are suffering. We are all struggling. Let's just pitch in and try to get back to some resemblance of, of normalcy. Um, <clears throat> I do want to also commend the Carver County website, the people who run the website, for posting uh, things like this, like the mask um, uh, information, the COVID information in Spanish. We have such a, a great, a huge, you know, Latinx community here. And, um, you know, helping, signaling to them that we're posting things in Spanish and we're, it's very inclusive of the community. And I just, that, that's just so great to see. So congratulations and thank you uh, for doing that posting in Spanish. All right. Have I spoken to Senator Jensen about his views on healthcare, drug costs, and COVID? I know this may not sound like a serious question or sound surprising to you, but I really want to know if you've had any dialogue with the current senator of our district at any time working together may not be that's a great question uh working together may not be an option but i don't want to not try it that's a really really great question i did meet right before i announced or maybe it was right after yeah it was right after i announced um that i was running for this seat right after i think it was two days after he announced that he was retiring um i did meet with him and we had a great conversation and it was mostly it was about you know why i got into politics i told him about my mom and the crazy cost of healthcare and what we can do to fix that. Um, we talked a lot about how the two-party system is really harming newer people trying to get into politics um, and really creating a lot of divisiveness between the two parties. You know, it's team blue and team red, and if you're on team blue, you're wrong. If you're on team red, you're horrible. You know, just all this partisan nonsense that I always talk about. We talked a lot about that. Um, and also about young people getting into politics and how we're kind of pushing the limits on everything, um, expanding people's minds of what politics can do, what it means, and what your government can do or should do for you. Um, and he honestly, he said to me that young people are going to be the, the change that we need to see in politics. And he was excited to see myself and um, one of my opponents, who's a couple years younger than me, getting into the race. At that point, coronavirus wasn't a thing that we knew about yet, so I have not talked to him about that specifically. Um, there's, I'm trying to figure out how to word this um, nicely. There is a huge difference of opinion that he and I have on this particular issue. Um, 
I have not engaged with him on his views on coronavirus. I've been really um, not impressed with not just him, but a lot of folks saying things seemingly to um, further their political career in the future or to get on to a television show, a national television show, just to get attention. And when I talk about these like red meat issues, dangling red meat in front of your base, that's what I'm talking about. Um, people that say things that may not be right or they may not 100% believe or may not 100% stand behind, but they're saying things to get attention and to get people riled up in an election year. You can see it on TV right now with the Biden and the Trump commercials. I just saw one last night that said, you're not safe in Biden's, or you will not be safe in Biden's America with no, with no facts to back that up and with no, um, <laughs> it's just fear mongering. So um, back to your question, I have not engaged with him on coronavirus specifically and I don't think that I will at this point. Um, yeah, I hate to say that because he's done really great things for our community some really great things. Um, and he's been a really, you know, fair, moderate voice up until this point, And there's just a switch that's flipped and I'm not sure why. So that's kind of a long answer for that short question. Sorry. Um, we did have a great conversation about transparency for prescription drug prices and, um, you know, public transparency pricing for, um, healthcare plans and hospitals and that kind of thing that I would love to pursue and do intend to pursue when I'm elected. It was great. And he was like, so what are you doing about your mom's health care? I'm like, let me tell you, sir. It was great. So, um, so thank you for that. You guys, any other questions, just keep popping them in the chat. This is a pretty open-ended discussion here today. So thank you for that. Let's see. Um, where are we? Okay. MDH, the Minnesota Department of Health, has said that they will, uh, Commissioner Jan Malcolm is incredible. I'm so fortunate. We are so fortunate to have her as the commissioner, uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Health here in Minnesota, she has said that we are going to step up, they're going to step up enforcement on, um, thank you, Mrs. Gale, I appreciate that, um, has, step, has said that they're going to step up enforcement on bars and restaurants that are not following the guidelines, so, um, you know, more people at a table that than are recommended or more um, people inside that are rec than are um, within the recommendations. That is great to hear that they are going to step up enforcement. Enforcement just means they're going to be visiting these businesses more often. Um, they're going to be issuing, you know, cease and desist letters or um, some kind of, you know, help letter before they get to like the more punishment side of things, fines and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of mitigation that happens, mitigation steps before they get to any kind of punishment. Um, there's been a huge increase in the calls to uh, the line to report businesses that are not following the CDC, uh, the MDH guidelines. Um, it's unfortunate that that is happening. And it's really unfortunate that we now have to rely on the Department of Health to enforce these things that we should all be doing as a community because we care about each other. So it's a bummer, but I'm really proud of the Minnesota Department of Health for being a really great leader in this endeavor. Um, all right. We are so fortunate to have Jan Malcolm at the NBA. She is wonderful. I wholeheartedly agree. I had the pleasure of meeting her when she uh, was helping one of the representatives I was working for um, with a breast cancer screening um, bill. And I, she's so personable and friendly and really easy to talk to and really knowledgeable. And that we need more of that in politics. Um, this kind of barrier of, um, you know, people that are in elected positions that are difficult to talk to are really not personal. It's a bummer. You know, you've got constituents that want to come in and meet people and, you know, any citizen of Minnesota that wants to talk to those folks should be able to. So um, people like Commissioner Malcolm are, are a welcome site at the Capitol. And I hope to be the same way. You know, I, I welcome all kinds of conversations from people that agree with me, people that are further left than me, people that are really right, people that are in the middle, people that don't care about politics at all. I welcome all of those conversations because that's how you learn and grow. Um, and I've been really energized by being in politics and feeling that I can change um, things, that I can improve my own community just based on the things that I'm doing. And I want other people to experience that too. So, um, all right. Oh, Eric just put a very nice reminder in the chat for you guys. Please go check that out. I will get to that too. I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, 
could you, Dan, could you talk about your experience doing 22 for 22 and what you took from it? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. I have not posted that on the um, campaign page, but I've been doing it on my personal page. My very, very good friend and coworker, Josh, um, was in the military as a vet, and he nominated me for this 22 for 22, um, meaning my dad's starting his truck. Sorry about that, guys. Um, meaning that you post every day for 22 days, you post um, your, a video of yourself doing 22 push-ups, crunches, or squats. And it's to raise awareness for the average of 22 combat veterans per day that commit suicide in our country. And I've talked about this before, and I certainly do want to do an entire town hall just on veterans issues. Um, it is appalling to me that we have more people, more combat veterans that come home and commit suicide than we have dying abroad. Um, so this is a challenge that was created to draw attention to that. Um, so, you know, of course I set an alarm every day and I, I've got to post my 22. And when I'm doing that, you know, I work out every day anyway, I do yoga every day anyway. So it wasn't too hard to get that into my um, workout routine. It was wonderful to be able to post those, nominate my friends um, to do the same thing. That was the other part of it that you had to nominate uh, another person every 22 days. Um, you know, really great to spread that awareness and see how people reacted. There was folks that kind of knew about it and kind of didn't and a lot that asked really great questions. I got a lot of texts from it, you know, oh, I didn't know you were interested in that or I didn't know, um, you know, that it was to that extent. The problem was that bad. Um, there's so much that we need to do. Kelly Moore, uh, Representative Kelly Morrison actually did the same challenge and did post it on her campaign stuff um, and then ended up carrying a bill. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, the details of the bill, but um, to address mental health with our veterans. So there's a lot we could be doing um, and a lot that's not happening. So I'm very, very happy to continue. I think I just posted today, it was my last day of doing it. Um, I'm happy to have brought a lot of attention to this issue and will continue to do so. And, you know, we've not to go off on a tangent here, but our veterans give sometimes the ultimate sacrifice. Their families sometimes give the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, the things that our country asks of them um, are things that not a lot of people are cut out to do. And when they come home, they deserve the most care that we can possibly give them. That's an incredibly difficult thing. So to come home and not have adequate mental health services, not have adequate health care or housing is really disturbing really, really disturbing to me. We're asking so much of them. The least we can do is make sure that them, that they and their families are taken care of when they come home. So thank you for asking that, Dan. Um, sorry if you guys can hear background noise. I think my parents, my dad left and my mom's going to garden with my brother, I think. So um, speaking of that, Sally asked, could you talk more about your family's political background? Absolutely. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. It's, it's such a Carver County story, I think. So I was, you know, born and raised here, brought up here. I actually started the Young Republicans Club at Chaska High School, which I don't think exists anymore. You know, we all kind of just thought we were Republicans. My grandfather worked as the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services under George Bush Sr. So my grandparents, my mom's parents, were very involved in politics. Um, I grew up Every day I'd go to their house every morning and I would watch um, all the morning talk shows with them and my grandma would make me a waffle, my brother would get on the bus and we would sit and talk about politics. And it was never, ever, you know, you believe this because you belong to this party or, you know, this person's right because they belong to this party. Never was that a topic of conversation. Always, always. It was, you know, this particular stance is good because of X, Y, and Z. And I, I distinctly remember one time saying, wow, I really like that position that Al Gore has on you know, guns or whatever it was. Um, and my grandparents didn't say, oh, you're, oh, I can't believe that you're wrong. They said, okay, let's talk about that. Why do you think that? If you had a stance, you better have the, you know, <laughs> the backup for it. Um, but it was a lot of, uh, it was a great growth uh, opportunity for me to explore my political background and my political knowledge and know how to talk about it. Um, I wish that a lot more folks had that uh, ability now to be able to negotiate and talk about um, really difficult things with people that you don't agree with. I think that's the only way we're gonna bring our community back together. Um, before I go off about that too, I do wanna mention my parents. My mom um, has always been traditionally conservative and 
moderately conservative, I should say, and uh, has switched over. She's Democrat now, um, proud Democrat. And my dad likes to say he's a libertarian. I don't think he really knows what he is, but he likes to say, you know, the government should keep our routes flowed and leave me alone, basically. Um, but the more that you peel back the layers on that onion, um, he's very unique. And I think a, he's a perfect example of how folks in this district think. And this is based on, you know, my door knocking in 2018 and now phone banking. Um, just folks that I've talked to in the community, like generally as a general concept, they want the government to leave them alone, but you peel things back and, you know, oh, maybe we should ban assault weapons. And, you know, why should a, uh, you know, person that's experiencing homelessness because of a mental health issue not have any help? And, you know, maybe we should uh, coronavirus is a perfect example. My dad's small business had to file for a small business loan. And, you know, why did Ruth Christie's Steakhouse get a small business loan? But, you know, this other company didn't. And um, Demog there's, and I've talked to a few people, this actually a couple of yesterday even, um, about this kind of partisan divide. And it's, tribalism is human nature. You want to belong to a group. Um, unfortunately, those groups have become so far apart and so divided that there's very little middle ground. And I truly, truly believe that people in this district live in that middle ground. There's not, this district doesn't belong to one party or another. And our representatives shouldn't belong to one party or another all the time. You know, you shouldn't just vote because the leader of that party in that chamber says you should vote that way. You should vote that way because you believe that that's the right thing or that is truly the best option that you have and your constituents feel the same way. So my upbringing has um, really lent itself to that collaborative effort and that vetting of ideas. I don't care who came up with a good idea. I care that it's a good idea and I want to vote for it and I want to get that good idea done. Um, there's this partisan polarization is really, it's honestly paralyzing our state and our country. Um, so I, that's a, a large reason of why I'm running is I was brought up to challenge that notion, um, that we, you know, are so divided and come up with good ideas and make sure that everyone's taken care of. Um, my family has done a, a wonderful job of teaching my brother and I that, um, so thank you for that question. And, you know, I, just to go off on another tangent here, I think my experience in both training horses and in a very, you know, blue collar line of work and also working as a, a, law, or a, a law clerk, I worked for a judge um, and, you know, going through law school has given me a lot of experience to, to speak to both of those kind of ways of life, right? Um, there's things that... Uh, in the horse industry, for example, and I could honestly have an entire hour-long town hall about the horse industry. Um, it's a love-hate relationship that I have <laughs> with that industry. But, uh, you know, I'm, when I was in Illinois, for example, I was living, had a beautiful home that I didn't own and I didn't pay rent for. That was part of my hiring package. And I was paid not that much. You know, the horse industry, staffers don't make that much. Assistant trainers and trainers and grooms don't make that much in the horse industry. Um, much to my parents' <laughs> delight that I took a law degree and graduated, got the degree and went and trained horses. Uh, I was living in a very nice home that I didn't own. I was training very, very nice horses. You know, average price of a horse that I was working with was like $300,000 that I don't own. There's no way in my life that I could own um, a horse like that. And the folks that we were working for our clients were often very wealthy. Um, a lot of them were heirs to some fortune or... Um, you know, had some business that they had sold previously that they had built up and sold and had a lot of money. And, you know, most of them were wonderful, amazing people that truly did take care of us. And that's why I stayed in the industry so long as our clients were incredible. And I worked with a lot of undocumented immigrants that came here from Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico. I had to learn a little Spanish to, you know, communicate with them. And their stories were so moving to me. Um, that they had given up, you know, their families or left their families or had brought their families over, you know, or running. One gentleman that I worked with told me a story about um, his hometown that he had grown up in that you could grow, when growing up, you could go play soccer outside. Everything was fine. And um, he would be on a street corner, you know, as he got to be a teenager, 20 years old, 25 years old. And the police were so corrupt there and the drug cartels were so bad there that you couldn't play soccer anymore and his kids couldn't play soccer anymore. You would get shot on the street if you went out. Um, and 
telling stories about how he got over the border, and I'm not advocating for that. Believe me, I am not advocating for that. It is dangerous and illegal and really hard. Um, it's a difficult thing, but to have them give up all that and go through all that and come here and literally live in a trailer with six other guys, get up in, you know, three in the morning, four in the morning, shovel, manure, and muck stalls and work, you know, really physical labor all day long and then go do it again six days a week, not be able to see their families and not be able to, none of them had a car. I would drive them to the store every week. Uh, that's really moving. That's a different version of the American dream. And, you know, you, I learned why people want to come here and why America seems so wonderful to other countries like that, that they can escape from that, make money and be safe. And that should be afforded to everyone in our community. And, um, just knowing those folks and have, having worked with those gentlemen, um, they that changed my view a lot, and I grew a lot um, working for with those folks for very wealthy people. It was, it was quite a difference. So um, I'm really glad that I had that opportunity. Uh, there was a lot of politics in the horse world. There was a lot of uh, well, we can get into this. Sure, why not? Uh, why I ended up actually leaving uh, in 2016. So I worked really, really hard. I uh, started, helped a, a family start a small business um, in Rochester, Orinoco area, a training business with my best friend. We had, I mean, we broke all kinds of records and we, uh, you know, exceeded our five-year expectation with our, um, with our finances uh, within the first six months. And we bought, we sold, we had horse camps, we had... Uh, horse shows. We had a whole bunch of clients. We had employees. It was it was great. It was so cool. It was such a great opportunity. Um, they ended up shutting that business down. So I went back to Illinois to train, and um, that was during the 2016 election. And most of you have heard the story about you know me visiting my mom and seeing her health care bill, her astronomical health care bill, and seeing that no one was really fighting that fight for us here in this community. And um, in the horse industry, it's very um, misogynistic and it's very class uh, you're kept in your place basically so I was an assistant trainer um, back in Illinois and the people I worked for were wonderful I'm not knocking them at all um, it was kind of accepted in the horse industry to as women to flirt for what you wanted I never did it because I'm I don't know, I, that's not me, but it was suggested to me that if I flirted with people, I would get what I wanted. If I tolerated this sexual harassment, I would get what I wanted. I would get more help. I would get my horse to be, you know, trimmed, his feet to be trimmed first um, in the line. Or, you know, just things that were very backyard or backwoods kind of 1950s were very accepted there. So I'm living in that world. And then I come back here and I see, you know, my mom's health care bill and wow, the climate crisis, and no one's really doing anything about it, and, you know, people are really upset about this thing or that thing, and, you know, our health care is being threatened to be taken away, and my brother experienced some, um, you know, mental health issues with his college, and wow, nothing's really being done about that, and I just could not not do anything about it, so I, as much as I loved training, I loved training horses, and it was so fun, um, I knew that I needed to do something more, and I knew that, um, you know, I'm the kind of person that is fearless and, you know, unapologetic in, in my drive. And, um, you know, I knew I needed to take my law degree and my voice and do some good. So I quit training. I broke up with the guy I was dating, packed up my dog and my horses, brought them all home. Um, ended up getting a job uh, at a hunting dog training facility with some family friends of ours just to kind of make ends meet while I got into politics um, to make a difference. And here we are, you know, a couple years later. So still so much to do. So I can't, I can't wait to, to win this election for you all and really make you all proud and bring some really positive change here. So, um, all right, let's go back to some comments here. Answer about party lines and how we navigate through decisions together is very refreshing. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, media is a big problem. You're right. The media is a big, big, big problem. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit as well. So thank you all for these comments. These are great. All right, so um, let's give you a campaign update really quick. We are, last I checked, about two hours ago, so it could be a little different now. We are $756 away from our goal for July, which is huge. So the pre-primary deadline is Monday, tomorrow. So if you guys can, 
donate $20, donate $50, donate $100, donate $200, become my best friend. Uh, <laughs> that would be incredible. And let me tell you what that goes towards. So that goes towards the cool things, this, the swag, right? The, the lawn signs, the t-shirts, the buttons, all that good stuff. More importantly, that goes towards getting this message out to everyone in Carver County. We're really limited in, we can't door knock. There are no parades. There are hardly any events. I can't go to any events because I live with a very high risk person. So we're using really cutting edge tools, the newest technology, the newest tactics to get this message to everyone else in Carver County. Those things are not cheap. And I, I truly hate asking for money. I really do. Um, I'm incredibly humbled at the outpouring of support that we've had both from in the district and now people that really believe in this vision. So when you donate, you're investing in that vision. Um, and you're helping us get this message out through um, text banking, phone banking, digital ads, mailers, all that good stuff. Um, so we, in order to ensure that we can flip the Minnesota Senate, we can actually get stuff done. And we have someone who represents Carver County, who was born and raised here, grew up here and believes what we believe. Donating is a huge help, huge, huge help. The other thing that is a really big help is making phone calls with us, phone banking, right? It uh, seems a little daunting and scary. We have an incredible volunteer coordinator, incredible campaign manager, both of which will train you. It's super fun, easy. Um, we give you a script, we give you a list of folks to call and you can go through and make these calls. Um, traditionally, if you've worked on campaigns in the past, calls have not been that exciting or fun. Your contact rate is really low. In this COVID life, um, people have been picking up the phone and they wanna to talk to people. So just last night, I, I had a great contact rate actually last night, and I talked to someone, a couple who had just moved here, and they moved here to have a hobby farm, which I have a hobby farm, my parents do, and we, you know, we're able to talk about that. And I talked to someone who had lived here for 60 years and had, you know, was very uh, excited about the new kind of future that we're trying to build here. Um, you, you know, occasionally you get some mean people, occasionally people, someone will hang up on you, but for every one of those, you do get a few really good ones. So you're connecting with people that live here, that are your neighbors or my neighbors, or you know maybe someone you live in Chaska, you're gonna connect with someone in Norway in America and you can talk to them about what they care about. Um, that is so inspiring to hear what brought people here or what keeps people here and what they truly care about, what they wanna see done. Um, governing and legislating should not be, like I said before, should not be based on what party leadership says or what you know, the news says it should be based on those conversations. So, you know, it does take a lot of these phone calls to win an election. It also takes a lot of these phone calls to continue representing the district in the way that, that I believe should be represented. So um, this is not a election thing. This is an ongoing thing. This is called organizing and I love it. I live for it. So if you want to join me in those calls, I would love to have you on this team. It is so worth it and so much fun. So please get in touch with us through any means, message me, text me, website, email, whatever it is, and we will get you set up to volunteer. So um, on that note, also, if you have not signed up for a lawn sign and you want one, uh, please do that on the website as well. And uh, t-shirts as well, they will be available. We're gonna do another order here in a little bit. So when you go out in the public, in you know, to the Cubs games or to your grocery store, you can be wearing an Addy for a men t-shirt. Um, oh, Nancy put the volunteer link in the chat, so please go fill that out. All right, I do want to read this. This is great. Uh, this is my first campaign. When I do phone banking, I feel like I'm really doing something that will make a difference. Yesterday, I helped someone navigate their absentee ballot. That is amazing. Yes, I love that. Oh, so exciting. Uh, speaking of that, good note, too. Early voting has already started, and unfortunately, I do have a primary, so um, someone jumped in kind of last minute and um, is not the right candidate for the Democratic Party for this district, and uh, so you can ensure that I will be the one on the ballot in November by voting in the primary, so you can do that via uh, online, uh, requesting your ballot online to have it sent to your home, and you can send it back in, or you can early vote now, uh, not today. I think it's already over for today, yeah, but you can go tomorrow. You can go any any time during the week to if Waconia residents can go to the Waconia City Hall. Everyone else can go to uh, the government center in Chaska. They have their very clear demarcations on their social distancing, kind of stickers on the floor, um, very limited people as to who can be in there at once. And they're really, really nice there. I don't know if you guys have talked to Kendra in the office. 
the elections office and the property tax office. She's amazing. And I'm pretty sure she's the one that staffs all of the early voting. So um, yeah, please go do that. Please, please, please. If you have questions about that, please let me know and we are happy to help you navigate that process. Um, real quick, I'll run through some other things and then we'll get to special session. But if you guys have more questions, please keep them coming. Um, so I did mention that Cubs games are back and um, I should, there's a Victoria team, a little pony team too. I should, <laughs> shouldn't just talk about Chasco, but uh, those are super fun. I will not be attending, unfortunately. You know, I do live with someone who's very high risk, um, but it is a really really great thing to to go watch so go check those games out um the arts consortium gallery in victoria is holding an artist of color experience from july 23rd to the 31st and i think it's right in downtown victoria please check that out it's such a cool thing that they're doing um and then i do want to give a shout out to our libraries there's some other i've talked to other you know folks that live in other districts that their libraries are not functioning anymore or they're closed down um, our libraries are doing contactless pickups and drop-offs, drop and um, they're doing things like renting out uh, Wi-Fi hotspots for those that have internet access issues and, and those kind of things. It's just incredible that they've been able to maintain that, so thank you all for doing that. Jay asked, how accessible do you plan to be with your constituents? Great question. Um, there's been, <laughs> traditionally, there's been some issues with folks getting elected and then just never talking to their constituents. Um, Looking at you, Congressman Emmer. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's certainly emails help, phone calls help. Uh, the representatives that I have worked for have taught me that you always take meetings with your constituents before any, no lobbyists, no activist groups, no you know random person that wants to talk to you about some random bill. No, you take constituent meetings first and foremost, always. I will always do that, that is a promise. I will always, always, always take one meeting with at least one meeting, if not as many meetings as you want. Um, most of those meetings traditionally are like 15 minutes. Um, at the Capitol, I'm happy to extend that for constituents. Lobbyists, I'm gonna keep them to 15 minutes, and groups, I'm gonna keep them to 15 minutes. Constituents, you can have a little bit more. Um, so I will instruct my legislative assistant to prioritize constituent meetings and contacts all the time. Let me know about any email that comes in, any phone call that comes in. Um, if I didn't answer it myself, I will be answering all of my own um, emails and phone calls, regardless of how mean they are. <laughs> There's been, uh, just working as a legislative assistant, you see some really crazy stuff. Uh, and this week we've seen some just insane stuff that comes in that I will get fired if I tell you all about. But, um, you know, as a representative or as a senator and elected representative, I will always answer those myself. So um, anyone is willing to tell me how they feel, tell me their opinion, uh, give me any research, send me stuff. I love reading things and analyzing and, you know, doing my nerd research about it. Um, that's how you get good ideas. Uh, I'll tell you a little story about uh, Representative Tabke, who I work for currently. Um, he represents Shakopee and someone called in. She owned, I think I've told this story before, so I apologize if this is a repeat. Great example of how I will operate as well. Um, someone called in and she owned a alcohol catering business for weddings, events, that kind of thing. And she, according to state law, it's kind of antiquated. You have to have a um, your license with a brick and mortar restaurant or a bar that may or may not have anything to do with your business. So she had a good relationship with someone local that was agreeing to you know, keep her license for her. Sorry, the wind's loud. Um, in exchange for some money. And you know, so she was looking to make that separate. This, there really shouldn't be any connection between two businesses that don't have any connection. Um, and in order for her to operate, she had to have that. In addition to getting license, licenses specifically for um, Minneapolis and St. Paul. So that wasn't a thing that Representative Chauke had ever thought about or that I had ever thought about. And she called in and she was so frustrated with it. And I said, okay, well, I'll get you a meeting with him and you guys can talk about it and we'll see what we can do. And it just like, she was shocked that that could happen. Yes, that really can happen. So it's it came from you know one constituent calling in and saying this is a problem. What can we do about it? To now there's a bill in existence that is going to um, classify them as their own catering section, basically. Um, the mechanics are a little bit wonky because our alcohol laws are, are very specific and interesting in Minnesota. Um, but it's it's just cool. I've seen that happen with my very own eyes on, on a state level. And um, that's exactly what I plan to do too. So if someone calls in and has a great idea, let's get it done. Cool, let's make it happen. So I appreciate that uh, 
that question, Jay. All right. So I have been asked to talk a little bit about special session. So I will start out by saying that staffers are not always kept in the loop all the time. Um, there's a lot of uh, caucus meetings that happen where staffers are not allowed to go um, specifically so we don't leak information, right? Uh, which is funny because it's, it's typically not staffers that do that. <laughs> but um, actually, okay, Sally, when we were in DC, with American Promise, we requested a meeting with all the Minnesota delegations. We met with the staff of most of them. Congressman Dean Phillips met with us for about a half hour. I love Congressman Phillips. He's amazing, honestly. Um, I will say it is really difficult to get a last minute meeting if you just show up, um, just based on experience. There's most of the representatives that I have done scheduling for are very back to back, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. So working it in can be difficult last minute. I will do everything I can to accommodate that. I've actually pulled representatives out of committee um, to meet with constituents in the hallway for a couple minutes if they're not voting on anything. And that's, you know, obviously not ideal. You want to be present and, and functioning in committee. Uh, but if someone shows up and they need something last minute, I will do my best to accommodate for sure. Um, <laughs> just thinking about some funny stories about that. So. Um, like I said, staffers are not always kept in the loop all of the time. So there's a lot that I don't know. Um, there's a lot of insider information that I just don't know. So I can't share it with you. Otherwise, I would. Um, there is stuff that I've seen, you know, emails and there's stuff that I've talked to my coworkers about or representatives about. Um, and there's a lot in the news that I've kind of condensed for you all. So uh, the other thing I will say is that 60 days after adjourning signing that, so adjourning the regular session, 60 days after that, I believe it was Monday or Wednesday, sometime either last week or this week. Uh, we as a legislature and as staff are not allowed to do any outreach anymore. So a lot of you guys saw um, the last email or mailer from, Rep we got one from Representative Nash. I don't think I got one from Jensen um, saying, you know, this is our last one follow. Instead of following this, you should be following the campaign page. They didn't say that outright, but that's kind of what they're suggesting that you do. Um, because it's illegal for us to do any outreach. So if you email or call in to your representative, your state representative now, you will still have that taken and processed, you know, how it should be. But there's no new neighbor letters going out or graduation letters or surveys or anything like that going out. So um, it's a little, we're operating a little bit differently right now. It's very strange. Um, it's very strange to continuously be called into special session and not really know when that's going to happen and what time and that kind of thing. So it's very um, fly by the seat of your pants right now as far as scheduling. Something that I'm quite used to uh, working in the horse industry. When you went to horse shows, you would have you know your 30 classes and you might have a horse in class 15 and a horse in class 17. But you have to get that horse ready at the right time and it's a lot of like sit around and wait. You don't know how long the classes are going to take. What if something happens and a horse throws a shoe in one of the classes and then you're delayed. It's just you might have a horse that's really excited and needs to get out early or one that's really lazy and you want to conserve his energy. Um, so I've done a lot of hurry up and wait in my life. So the legislature is very much that way and I will have no problem with that. I already do it now. Um, so no problem in that transition. So they will be coming back uh, Monday, tomorrow and voting on a few things. So um, I actually asked one of my friends who works at the Senate. Let me check and see if he said anything. Um, about what they're planning to vote on. So um, we, okay, interesting. So I asked him what um, to expect from the Senate on Monday, and he said they're going to try to vote on a resolution to make Walls' executive orders on education invalid. Um, that's interesting. Well, the House is going to be doing some very different things. Uh, so one major thing that hasn't gotten done yet that needs to happen is the bonding bill. So the the four caucus leadership has agreed on a cap of $1.35 billion to be spent on this bonding. So um, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with bonding, it's basically state funded projects to either uh, maintain or repair some type of project. Maybe it's a bridge or, um, you know, higher education asset preservation. So fixing like a lab, a ceiling in the lab or something like that. Um, or it's to expand or maybe even beautify some some things. Uh, the water treatment facility in Bemidji is a great example. Um, they're up to capacity in their 
water treatment facility and their town is growing like crazy. So um, they had a big bonding project to expand that. I think our recent bonding projects that were submitted um, that are likely not on the list anymore, things to do with Highway 41, Highway 5, um, that kind of thing. So, and if you have any questions about our infrastructure projects here, Randy Maluchnik, commissioner, um, has been at the forefront of all of these fights and uh, has gone to DC to advocate to get federal funding for our roads and bridges here, um, since the state hasn't really been able to do that uh, recently. And he is a great resource. If you have questions, please reach out to him or reach out to me and I'll get you connected with him. Um, there is uh, an opportunity that um, I believe is gonna be pursued to combine the bonding bill with the tax bill. Part of having separation between, you know, different legislature, like a divided legislature, is you have to be able to compromise. And you have to be able to do that well. And I think a really good indicator that the House is willing to compromise is by saying, yeah, we can combine it with a tax bill. Um, so the House DFL offered federal conformity to the tax code, to the federal tax code, which it's not right now. Um, that includes a break for new equipment purchases so that would help our farmers a lot that's something the republicans in the senate have been after for a long time um, so that's just a good example of an olive branch right or like a sweetener um, offering something up that that maybe you don't a thousand percent agree with but is going to get the ball rolling we need to see a lot more of that to get any kind of movement uh, randy maluchnik is an awesome farmer county commissioner wholeheartedly agree nancy absolutely i wish I lived in that district, <laughs> but anyway, um, there is going to be, this is my prediction, going to be a bigger fight than has to be <laughs> about rebuilding um, Minneapolis and St. Paul after the aftermath of George Floyd's murder. Um, FEMA denied the uh, Mayor Carter and Mayor Fry's request for funds, for federal funds. Um, pretty typical for something like that, that FEMA would deny those funds. It happened under the Obama administration as well. Um, they can reapply and, and appeal the decision, likely going to stand just based on knowing our federal government's stance on how Minnesota um, is operating. Uh, so there is likely to be a big fight on both House and Senate floors about uh, if the state should pay for that um, rebuilding and uh, how. So yet to be seen where it's going to fit in and yet to be seen how that's going to happen. I hate to sound jaded. I really do, but I just don't have a lot of faith in that being resolved in an appropriate way. So there has been an ongoing fight that has been driving me insane <laughs> as a staffer about ending the peacetime emergency. And there's been a lot of misinformation about walls being a dictator and walls having so much power and, um, you know, the state's so shut down, we need to open up. And and uh, the people that I work for are constantly challenging that notion. And I appreciate that. So just a reminder of, of things that we would lose if we were to end the peacetime emergency right now. We would lose, uh, we would end our ability to be able to quickly purchase PPE for our frontline workers, our healthcare workers. We would end the ability for law enforcement to receive any data on COVID cases, uh, which keeps them safer when they're going into people's homes and into the community and conserving PPE too. Um, we would end deregulation on farm activities. There's been a couple of different exceptions as far as um, transportation of livestock and very important things to keep our farms going. Um, we would end mental health professionals' ability to treat out-of-state students. So, uh, you know, someone that's in Wisconsin that's been going to a therapist on campus at the U of M, there's an exception now that they can continue treatment. If we were to end the peace emergency with no protections, that could end. Um, potentially end healthcare coverage for testing. We could maybe change or end housing assistance, unemployment. If we're ending the peacetime emergency and we're revoking Walls' powers, I hate to call them powers, um, with no protections and no backup plan, we are in a very, very bad spot. We are gonna lose a lot of really good things that we've got going for us. Also to remind everybody, 49 of 50 states currently are still extending the peace time emergency that's still happening. So I'm not sure how anyone could look at the chart of cases and how it's continuously for this for you guys continuously going up and up and up and say that there is no emergency. There is still an emergency. There are still a lot of people struggling and we need to have off ramps or backup plans before we end any peacetime emergency. 
Uh, that being said, Governor Wallace has offered the legislature, I think, 20 or 30 of his 70 executive orders offered that the legislature take them up and take them over. Judging by how the last special session went and how regular session ended, I don't have a lot of confidence in that being appropriate. Um, is there a likelihood of a third special session? Yes, absolutely. They have told us as staffers to expect to be called in to special session repeatedly until the next session starts, basically. Um, so every 30 days, if Wells wants to, or declares to extend his um, the peacetime emergency, he has to call the legislature back into session and then the legislature has to vote to allow that or not allow it consistently. The Senate has voted to not allow it and the House has voted to allow it and then nothing happens. So it's allowed um, after that. So we, as long as um, Wells keeps extending the emergency, we will keep going back into special session. And I know just based on the four caucus agreement of getting a bonding bill done that that is priority and we will probably keep going back until that gets done. That being said, I am incredibly disappointed to see Senate leadership and several senators uh, take a joy trip out to DC to take a photo op in front of the White House. And normally I'm not I'm not blasting people for things like that, but it's when you have, you know, folks, a lot of folks, millions on unemployment, um, looking for jobs, uh, you know, struggling with, with all of this, and people dying from coronavirus in your state, and you are supposed to be negotiating in good faith and working hard and working hours and hours and hours, and you are going to fly out to DC and take a picture in front of the White House. Really disappointing. Um, that's a lot of the, the do nothing that we see of the Senate that I talk about all the time. There's a lack of initiative and a lack of good faith negotiations and wanting to get stuff done. And I can't stand it. You guys. I can't, it just drives me nuts. I'm the kind of person who will work and work and work until it gets done. And the end result might not be what I thought it was going to be at the, at the start of this, but the job's going to get done. And there's not breaks until that happens. So, you know, for this, for example, you know, folks have asked me, you know, when can you hang out? When can you, um, you know, go to happy hour? When can you do this? When can you do that? I'm like, after November. Can't talk to you until after November. You want to want to be my friend? Be on a Zoom call with me while I'm phone banking through the election. Like, there, you have to have that will and that drive to get things done. And for our Senate leadership to just up and fly out to D.C. for no reason, um, they weren't, like, advocating for money or anything. It was simply a photo op. Um, really disappointing to see. So I think that there will be a lot of special sessions until every party is coming together to negotiate in good faith and not for election years and not for, you know, pretty commercials and things um, and floor speeches. And this is this is a, a knock on both sides for doing this um, until that we can come together and make something happen. It's, it's going to continue, unfortunately, which which is really fun for staff. <laughs> We're like, oh, when is it happening? Okay, make sure it's on the calendar. So it's it's just been crazy. Um, good call on Randy Maluchnik. He's done a lot, or quite a bit for highway funding, keeping 212 safe, heightening our libraries and our services. And he has been instrumental, sorry, uh, in getting our county's veterans access to VA health care. Absolutely. And I believe he is a veteran as well. Um, Carver County veterans health care access has doubled since he got into office. Uh, which has come in handy for veterans laid off or furloughed right now. Absolutely. I'm so impressed with that. This, that's the kind of dedication and drive that we need in all elected officials. Um, what's the topic of the day? I'm a bit late. Mac Millen, Mac. Are you? That's funny. My brother's name is Mac, and I know you're not my brother. Hmm, weird. Um, we don't have a topic for the day. We're just kind of spitballing and taking questions. So if you've got a question, please put it in the comments, and I will be happy to answer it. Um, so one other thing that I do want to mention is there was a court hearing, uh, the Ramsey County District Court, which is actually the fun fact, the court that I did my clerk, my externship in. Um, I worked for Judge Gary Bastion, who has retired. He's amazing. Really, really great guy. Taught me a lot about being a judge and being a lawyer. Um, anyway, there was a court hearing uh, to examine if Walls' extension of the peace time emergency and his powers were constitutional. Um, and there is not a rush on that decision, and I'm fairly confident that they will say, yes, they were constitutional. So um, that's still going on, and it's just uh, kind of another, just based on who is leading that lawsuit, 
it's very politically motivated. Fun fact, so we're spending tax dollars on a court fight that doesn't need to happen. Anyway, um, another really great thing that needs to get done and that there is a middle ground on uh, is the police reform. So we all saw that video. We all saw George Floyd get murdered at the hands of white police officers. There has been a lot of conversations and a lot of collaboration. Um, yeah, so the House the House Posse Caucus, I've talked about this before, so I apologize for repeating myself, but the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus in the House came out with a slate of legislation to address uh, police reform and address some of the systemic racist issues, racism issues in um, our criminal justice system. And there's been several um, initiatives to do the same thing in different other areas. So I'm currently kind of helping with a bill um, to get more teachers of color in higher educational institutions, recruiting more teacher candidates basically um, for teachers of color. So there, there's a big push for those kinds of bills in the House right now. In the Senate, I'm not sure, um, just because I don't work there day to day yet. Um, so the Senate's response to that was to hold very limited hearings about the basically what happened after. So not a lot of what happened during um, George Floyd's murder or why that happened or looking at the history um, behind that action and, and why that was allowed and that particular officer was allowed to continue to be an officer. Nothing like that. It was about the riots and the protests and it was just very politically motivated and I, I can't stand it. It's just a slap in the face to people who are actually doing the work and have been doing that work for decades. Um, we have a really, really great historical opportunity to get on the right side of history and to back out of that and kind of take a back seat and be afraid to have those conversations is just, it's not doing anything. It's not going to do anything for us. And the legislature that doesn't want to do that is not one that works for us. So I have talked at length about how, you know, different bills are not getting vetted in the Senate that deserve to be. Um, and it's that's part of the reason why I'm running. I'm, I'm really tired of watching our tax dollars go to waste over really silly things. So um, the Senate did offer the last special session a very limited uh, police reform package, um, banning a chokehold, uh, having that duty to intervene. It was a good step, it was just not enough. Um, and I rarely say that, but in this instance I will. It was just not enough. So um, they're doing a lot of framing the issue around defunding the police, and that is such a buzz. I'm sorry, I'm going over, but this is very important, so I'm going to, get, I'm going to go over. Um, they're framing the issue around defunding the police, and that, even in my phone calls um, that I've been making to constituents here, that is on the forefront of everyone's mind, and they're saying we don't want to defund the Carver County Sheriff's Department, we don't want to defund the Chaska Police Department, and I agree. I heard, uh, actually, I think it was the 47A candidate, Arlen Brinkmeyer, who said that people in Minneapolis want to be policed the way that we are doing it here in Carver County. And, you know, there's always room for improvement. There's always things that, that could be better. Um, I've been pretty impressed and hopeful in um, the steps that uh, Sheriff Camerud and um, Chief Siebert have been taking to uh, be inclusive in these conversations and make really good, meaningful steps um, towards improving our police force here. Um, Minneapolis is a very different place and has a very different reputation. In my discussions with former um, law enforcement officers, Minneapolis has a police have a not great reputation um, for how they handle things. So um, that's don't be distracted by that. I guess is what I'm trying to say. There was nothing in any of the posse caucus legislation that advocated for defunding the police. And people that are saying, oh, that's all the Democrats want to do, that's just not true. You know, it's just a distraction from the actual issue, and it's it's meant to throw you off. So don't get distracted from that. Read the bills. Do your vetting. Do your research. If you have questions, ask me. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, I hope that this special session we can drop some of the really extreme, you know, stuff, and we can get somewhere in the middle. There is a middle ground that can be reached. You know, it should be a requirement for everyone that's in the legislature to take the same negotiation course that I, this 90 hour negotiation course that I did in law school, like that changes your perspective on negotiating. Um, 
So I can't wait to get to get in there and put that to good use, let me tell you. Um, there will be a uh, discussion about school openings. Uh, the end of next week, we're expecting uh, the Department of Education for Minnesota to come out with their recommendations. Um, We've seen leadership, lack of leadership from the federal government on this issue. Um, I have zero respect for Betsy DeVos, I hate to say it, but I don't. Um, she announced that uh, if international students weren't going to a school that had in-person learning, they would have to go back home, which is crazy to me. Um, those are not you know, illegal immigrants. Those are not criminals. Those are students that have are paying a lot of money to be here and learn. Um, so there we saw a huge influx of um, higher educational institutions that were making basically a, a class, an in-person class um, for these international students so they could get around this rule and remain here. And um, they you know, then came out and said, oh, just kidding, we're gonna take that rule back. It's not actually a rule. Um, so there's a lot of confusion in the higher education department about what the federal government's going to require and what they expect and there's just not there's not clear guidelines and we see the same thing with k-12 not clear guidelines yeah send all the kids back to school okay how um my i've spoken before about how i come from a family of educators my grandmother's sister um so my great aunt and a lot of my cousins um, my dad was a substitute for a very brief period of time uh so i called one of my cousins how do you guys feel about going back to school. And she said, we've proven that we can do remote distance learning. That is, it's not ideal. The kids don't like it. The teachers don't like it. Of course, they would rather be in the classroom. But that's not why we're being forced back is what she said. She said that they need, uh, they don't need education, they need child care. And to send teachers in, because of the child care, you know, there's lack of child care right now. And it's, it's, very hard to have kids at home in distance learning. I totally understand that. Um, that being said, teachers are not expendable. Okay, so if we're if you're advocate, if someone's advocating for fully opening schools and sending all the teachers back, but you're also not advocating to fully fund education, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't go together. So, if we are, in my opinion, if we are going to be sending teachers and kids back full time, we need to fully fund public education. We need to make sure that those class sizes are very small, even smaller than what I have in my head. And the teachers have PPE and there's social distancing. Kids have to wear masks and then you have to teach young kids how to wear I mean, it's just, it, I'm terrified for if this happens for our teachers. It's about protecting our kids and our teachers. And it was atrocious to hear the federal government say, oh, only, you know, 10% of kids will, will die. Well, that's like 15,000. You know, the, the numbers are astronomical for, we're talking about children dying. I don't care if it's one. One. That's a child dying because we wanted to put them back in school. So I'm hoping, I'm really, really hopeful that the Department of Education um, in Minnesota will come out with guidelines that are helpful for teachers and for parents um, and, you know, suggestions for whether it's an in-person model, a hybrid model, a remote distance learning model. Um, that those are really, really well thought out and carefully crafted and and, um, and taken care of. So, yet to be seen, and I anticipate a lot of debate on the, on the floor about that as well. All right, um, since we've gone over a little bit, Jay mentioned that I do have a primary challenger and he uh, advertised in the villager. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, how do we talk about this without being there's um okay so i when i formed my uh campaign committee which is what you have to do to file with the campaign finance board in the state of minnesota so you're you know following all the laws um you sign you have to raise or spend 750 dollars, and that's your threshold for filing so i did that right away um so we are bound by all of the campaign finance rules my opponent has not done that, and he chose to spend money, I believe it's his own money, but there's no way to know, um, to put an ad that is over $750 in um, these papers. So um, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're not going to spend that money. Um, there's much better ways, I think, to reach voters. So uh, I will be submitting an LTE, so please look out for that in either the next or the one after um, Jan Asenchaski Villager and the Sun Patriot. 
um, I will be submitting the LTE for that to talk about why I am the better choice. Um, so very briefly, I'll give you guys kind of an overview. I have been in this fight um, and you know signed up. I've been campaigning for a year. I have raised uh, quite a bit of money and we have reached quite a few voters. Um, I've spent a lot of time listening and building relationships within the community that I believe will further um, our message and will make me a better legislator. I'm very um, careful and, and deliberate in those relationships that I'm building. Um, and I do a lot of, I'm a nerd. I do, I'm a law school nerd, right? I do a lot of research and learning how to do the job. So part of the reason why I'm working at the house right now and why I joined uh, a couple campaigns before that was I wanted to learn how to campaign and then how to govern. I didn't want to go into this blind and not know, you know, what to expect and have to have the steep learning curve and um, have, you know, thousands of people in Carver County relying on me to do a good job and not know how to do the job. So um, my opponent in the primary has not done any of those things. And in fact, uh, as you said, Jay does not understand how government works. There's a few things that the Senate at the state level cannot do. Um, and for someone to promise that they will do those things uh, is misleading. And it's really unfortunate. So, um, you know, I strongly believe that I am the right person to be on the ballot in November. I'm the right person to win in November as well. Um, we've, you know, from the very beginning, my team has set our sights in November. Um, we, there's a lot of danger in electing some of the other folks that are on the ballot. Uh, we are, we believe that I am the rational and logical um, choice alternative <laughs> to those. And I will always lead with positivity, even in times like this. It's really hard to be positive right now, but we can't be afraid and we can't lose hope. And there's so much more that brings us together than divides us and we just need somebody at the state level to advocate for that this is a very unique place to live with very um you know it's a very specific way of living out here and we need someone at the legislature that's going to advocate for us so you know i was born and raised here i've lived here my whole life other than that little you know brief stint in missouri and illinois um and I have a very unique perspective on what it takes to win an election and what it takes to be a good legislator. And I firmly 100% believe that I will be that person. So um, thank you, Nancy, for putting the donate button down there. Uh, that being said about the primary, um, we now have to spend more money, which kind of sucks. So we're going to have to spend more money to make sure we can turn out the vote and make sure people vote for us, uh, for me, um, in, in August, August 11th, or now, tomorrow go to your local polling place and vote um, to make sure that, that we've got the right one on the ballot for November. So um, thank you for that question. I appreciate that. Uh, I invite people. I like uh, primary challenges. I think it makes a better candidate um, if someone's actually in it for the right reasons, and I don't believe that my opponent is. So that being said, I really appreciate everyone's support thus far, and we've got twice as much work to do now. So if you've been sharing and liking everything on our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, please continue to do, to do that. If you want to volunteer, that's the best thing in the world you can do to ensure that, <coughs> excuse me, that not only I win in August, but I win in November, and we have a great um, you know, represent, representation at the state level come January 2021. Can't wait. Um, so I really appreciate that. Thank you everyone for that. Um, I will also say we've had a couple suggestions come in through our you know, email and inbox and stuff. Uh, and an LTE in the Herald and Villager is only 60, exactly. That's what we're gonna do. I'm not spending $750 to um, have an ad right now. It's just not, I wanna be a good steward of our donors dollars as I will be a good steward of our taxpayer dollars as well, so. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so since we've gone 15 minutes over, sorry guys, I really appreciate you sticking with me here. Um, I want to end with a couple quotes. So my yoga class this morning, I took a class with a gentleman from Boston who is kind of this leading expert in the type of yoga that I do, and he talked a lot about gladdening your mind. And it's really scary and hard and difficult right now. Our state of politics is insane, and it's really disheartening state federal is even worse and then we have coronavirus and we have unemployment and we have all these 
really scary, crazy, unnormal, unnatural things um, that are going on. And it's a practice, for those of you who've tried meditation, I'm terrible at it because my mind's always going. Um, but for those of you who have tried meditation, know that it's a practice. And what this instructor was saying, gladdening your mind is also a practice. So taking things and not just putting rose-colored glasses, oh, it's all fine, that's not what I'm saying. But taking it and saying, his example was, you know, you got on your mat today and you're really tired and you're dragging. Like, you could just focus on that and say, oh, you know, man, I suck at this today. Or, man, I'm not, I'm not trying hard enough today. Or you could say, hey, thanks, body, for getting me to this mat and doing the work. So I could say, it's really frustrating to run as a Democrat in a traditionally Republican race. I could say, you know, I'm going into uh, an election that's going to be really tough and probably pretty nasty based on some of the other stuff that I've seen out there. Um, you know, I could say having a divided legislature means we're not going to get anything done. That's all true. Um, that's the practice of gladdening your mind is changing that to say, I am doing this work. I have the privilege to do this. I have the privilege to sit here on my parents' porch and talk into a computer and reach you and talk to you. And you have the, the ability to reach out and talk to me and ask me questions um, and get involved on this campaign. And we have the ability together to really make change. And it's hard. It's going to be really hard. But all of us together can do that. And um, I am committed to gladdening my mind. And I invite you all to do the same. And um, hopefully that can start to change some perspective um, away from more of like the negative aspects and more towards the hopeful, what we can do. Um, changing, you know, pro problem to progress or obstacle to opportunity is what I like to say. And uh, I would be just remiss if I did not mention uh, Congressman Lewis, who passed away um, two days ago, I believe. And uh, just an incredible civil rights leader that will be sorely, sorely missed. So I want to end today with two quotes that are so inspirational to me, and I hope it inspires you as well. If you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. So a lot of you guys have heard my speeches, and you know that I say do something repeatedly. Moral obligation to do something about it. It's really easy to sit and just accept it and say, oh, that sucks and not do anything about it. It's really easy to hop on a plane to DC and take a picture in front of the White House when you should be negotiating a bill. That's not fair, it's not right, it's not just, and you have a moral obligation to do something about it. So I'm committed to do, doing something about a lot of things. And if you have a suggestion for what I need to do something about, please let me know. The last one I'll leave you guys with is uh, from Congressman Lewis is, our struggle is a struggle to redeem the soul of America. It's not a struggle that lasts for a few days, a few weeks, a few months, or a few years. It is the struggle of a lifetime, more than one lifetime. We're in this, you guys, for the long game, okay? This isn't a Band-Aid fix, um, especially now. We're going to have to climb out of this giant hole that coronavirus has put us into. Um, this election... You know, even this week, this month, this election, next session, it's not going to fix everything. We're in this for the long game, right? So it's, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get burned out. It's easy to be afraid or um, procrastinate. I'm a, you know, that happens to me. I get it. <laughs> but um, we're in this for the long game. Every little bit that you do today changes it for tomorrow. Every single little bit. I always say that with our volunteers, too. You're making calls and you might get someone who's really hostile and doesn't want to talk to you and hangs up. And that sucks. It does. But that's helping us for the next round. Well, we're not going to contact that person and we don't have to send someone else out to contact that person. Um, so every little bit that you do today changes it for tomorrow. Everything that we're doing today is going to change it for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So everything that you're doing is helpful. Okay. If you're just taking care of yourself and making sure that you're okay that day, that is helpful. That makes sure that you can show up for someone tomorrow. So don't get discouraged. I know it's really tough right now. Um, and we're all struggling, but we are all struggling together. So thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate <clears throat> all of your time and spending an extra 20 minutes with me. I appreciate it. Um, please join the volunteer team. Please donate. Please vote. And please take care of yourselves and each other. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Uh, appreciate the sincerity, love the quotes, staying in it for the long game too. Thank you, Adam. Me too. I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. I'm young. I'm only 32. Let's do this. All right. <laughs> Take care, you guys. I'll see you next week.